So the whole Andretti thing going on, I thought I'd trundle through the archives to see what happened the last time a bunch of new teams entered Formula 1. Because new teams on the grid mean more cars. More cars theoretically means better racing. And it starts to get people clamouring for the time of when there was 26 cars starting every Grand Prix. The last time that happened, by the way, was 1995, when 26 cars were vying for 26 slots. The year before, 1994, saw 28 cars go for 26 slots. So 28 cars went out for qualifying, but two each time would have to sit out the main event on Sunday. Pacific and Simtech were the two new teams that year, and the grid was at the maximum the FIA would allow every Sunday. Assuming nobody had to sit out through injuries, such was the carnage of 1994. But at the end of the 1994 season, LaRousse and Lotus left the sport due to money woes and only one team in 40 came to replace them. So in 1995, the first five rounds of the season had 26 entries, which then became 24 when Simtech folded around the Monaco Grand Prix. Pacific folded at the end of the season, so for 1996, 40 was the only minnow left on the grid, with them and Minardi about to fall victim to the 107% rule. But 40 went bust just before the 1996 German Grand Prix. Stewart and Lola came in to replace them, but Lola didn't get past the first Grand Prix because they too had gone bust, through a myriad of reasons which I might need to revisit at some point. So, for the 1997 season, the number was 22 cars. On your screen, I've put up the new teams that have come in as all new entries since the start of the 1994 season, so I'm not counting renames or acquisitions of other teams. So, no Red Bull taking over from Jag, that kind of thing, just to see what's there, and it's quite interesting. In 1994, Pacific and Simtech joined. In 1995, 40 joined. In 1997, you had Stewart and Lola. 1999, British American Racing. 2002, Toyota. 2006, Super Aguri. 2010, HRT, Virgin and Lotus. And in 2016, Haas. And like I said, renamed teams haven't counted here. Okay, you could call Racing Point a new team, but it was the old Force India team. It didn't actually add more cars to the grid. But the three new teams we will concern ourselves with here are the ones that came in for 2010. HRT, Virgin and Lotus. The reason for them being on the grid was pretty simple. Formula 1 was risking running out of entries. Because of the 2008 financial crash, Honda had abruptly pulled out, meaning that Rubens Barrichello, Jensen Button and many, many more people were going to be potentially unemployed. But Ross Braun came along, saved the team, entered it as Braun, went on to somehow win the championship the following year. At the end of 2009, BMW, who were with Sauber, pulled out, as did Toyota. Toyota's struggles we've looked at previously as they spent a lot of money to not win anything. And this in turn formed part of the problem. The teams at the start of the decade were either full-up factory operations such as Renault, Toyota, Ferrari, Jaguar, or they were privateers with factory support like McLaren, Williams, BAR. And then you've got the last of the garage Easters, Minardi and Jordan, who were clinging on for dear life. And with the world starting to say that tobacco was socially unacceptable, and many nations banning tobacco advertising outright in sports, the tobacco companies with their endless supplies of cash were starting to pull out, as their logos were now only being seen at a tiny amount of races. And because the manufacturers had spent so much and the budgets had been driven so high, when the market crash hit in 2008 it was either penny pinch or get out. So BMW, Honda and Toyota did, and Super Aguri went bust in the 2008 season, while the others were left behind. Also in 2008 was the threat of a breakaway series. The FIA had announced a lot of changes that the teams didn't agree with, one of those being the introduction of cost caps and budget limits. So not only was this opening up for new teams designed to fill the gap left by the likes of BMW, Toyota and Honda, it was also, if this breakaway series started, to ensure that F1 still existed. But thankfully, the signing of a new Concord agreement in the August of 2009 put an end to any threats of the breakaway league, and F1 was saved. But the FIA and Formula 1 still had three slots on the grid they wanted to fill. So enter the teams that signed up. The FIA opened up the tender twice in this time frame, the first being in 2006 for 2008, and a whopping 22 teams signed up. Which might get you thinking, wow, F1 was really popular back then, but really it was the teams that already existed taking up the first lot of the slots and then it was whoever was left over basically. One of the teams that tried to enter at this time was ProDrive, headed up by Dave Richards who was Colin McRae's boss at Subaru and was part of the Subaru World Rally team that would win the Drivers' Championships in 95 and 2001. ProDrive was given one of the slots on the basis that it had a motorsport pedigree. This was the Subaru World Rally team for all intents and purposes and had done a lot of stuff in other forms of motorsport. Currently, 
ProDrive builds the cars for Lewis Hamilton's Extreme E team, and has also done some stuff for Aston Martin, as well as having an Australian arm of the company that operated Ford Falcons and V8 supercars. They also won the BTCC with Ford in 2000. Oh, and for a time they were managing the British American racing team that later became Honda. This was back in 2002, and the reason they got that gig was because ProDrive was the Subaru rally team that had 555 sponsorship, which is British American Tobacco. Yeah, we talk about tobacco sponsorships, but BAR was literally owned by a tobacco company. The reason ProDrive's F1 bid didn't go ahead at this point is because they were intending to buy chassis from McLaren and use them as their own. And this isn't a new thing in Formula 1, and in a way it still happens with Haas having ones made by Dallara. But in the 70s, to reuse a line from my last video, a March chassis with a Hewland gearbox and a Cosworth DFE was basically the garage Easter starter pack. Even before then, in the 60s, so many teams were running McLaren, Brabham, Cooper or Lotus cars as an off-the-shelf solution to get into F1 quickly. But the FIA shut down that idea. Williams had voiced their objections to ProDrive running these customer chassis, saying why are they allowed to just buy one while we've got to build ours? The FIA then changed the rules for 2009. Chassis had to be built by the teams in-house or outsourced to a company like Dallara, which I think stopped Red Bull and Toro Rosso sharing parts as well. The FIA opened up the tenders again in 2008 to get teams on the grid for 2010, and in 2009, just before the Concord Agreement was signed, they announced who the three applicants or the three successful applicants were. USF1, MANA, and Campos. USF1 is something that might require a visit at some point. Unfortunately, it's one of the Purge videos from a few years ago, which is bloody annoying because it got over 100,000 hits, but the long story short is the team was just nowhere near ready. They hadn't got anything built and the FIA thought they were taking the piss. So their entry got cancelled, and the entry was offered to ProDrive, who were going to end it under the Aston Martin banner, but it never came to fruition. Again. In the end, the three teams that did enter were Campos, who entered under the HRT name, Manor, who entered under the Virgin name, and Lotus, headed up by Tony Fernandez, that brought the Lotus name and British Racing Green back to the grid. Lotus had actually been on the reserve list along with ProDrive, but extra funding from Fernandez gave the FIA the assurance that this team was going to actually make it to the grid, and they took USF1 spot. And the FIA had been sweet-talking all three of them onto the grid. Given the situation with the economy and how there'd be three privateers battling the likes of McLaren, Ferrari and other established names, they were given the following promises. $10 million upfront plus subsidised freight, given that they weren't going to be in the prize money structure. That in itself is a minefield, but basically they had to be in for a whole season to take advantage of the previous season's prize money. Since they were new, there was no money for them to take, because they hadn't earned any yet. And there was the promise of a cost cap, but that never came. And that failed cost cap immediately started to put pressure on the new teams. HRT were really struggling, and their first test session pre-season was the first practice session for the Bahrain Grand Prix on that absolutely pointless extended version of the track. Sponsorship deals weren't getting through the door, and this in turn led to Delara sending repeated emails and making repeated phone calls to say, so uh, it's been 24 hours, you, uh, you got my money? HRT was a junior team that had come up into Formula 1, and as a junior team they'd done alright. In various series, they'd had the likes of Mark Genet, Fernando Alonso, Antonio Garcia driving for the team. They'd won the team's championship in GP2 in 2008. And while they weren't as dominant as the likes of Prema or Carlin today, they were ever-present, always there, and always able to compete. And they'd got into Formula 1 at Carlin's expense as well. Finally, though, they got the backing from Jose Roman Carabante, who led the Hispania group, which then led to the team being called Hispania Racing Team, or HRT, rather than Campos. The HRT team was left to just toddle through the 2010 season because they could barely pay Dallara for a car, let alone upgrades for it, while the other two seemed to have some decent battles, because the prize money on offer for whoever would finish 10th in the constructors would be a massive lifeline. Lotus from the outset seemed to have better backing. Proton was putting money in, and any Malaysian government investment was going to come from Proton and nowhere else, and they also had the backing from a consortium of Malaysian business owners. They also had Mike Gascoigne, formerly of Jordan, Toyota and other teams on board, and the team was based out of Lotus's factory in Norfolk. And in the first race at Bahrain, the Lotus of Kovalainen was the only one of the six new cars to finish, although Trulli was classified because he'd completed 90% race distance. The Virgins and Lotuses were pretty close together, which was pretty good for Lotus given that they'd been accepted onto the grid late and only had their first mock-ups running in the February of 2010. The other team, Mana, running as Virgin due to the backing from Richard Branson's company, was by far the most successful of the three teams. 
Their first season, they had Timo Glock and Lucas Degrassi in the car, with Glock providing the experience needed, while HRT had Karun Chantok, Christian Kleon, Bruno Senna, and Sakon Yamamoto as their drivers for the season. But somehow, HRT beat Virgin to 11th in the Constructors. Virgin also had Nick Worth's experience, Worth having been part of the SimTech team and had been an early pioneer of computer design in Formula 1. But while the fight at the front between the top teams hotted up, the battle between Lotus and Virgin was equally as good. Lotus had struck a deal with Red Bull for gearboxes and hydraulic systems as well as getting Renault engines for 2011. They'd also strengthened the team with a bunch of X-Force India employees. Virgin, on the other hand, had managed to get technical support from Ferrari despite the fact they were still using Cosworth engines, and Lotus really wanted to be hitting mid-grid in 2011. Then Lotus entered a bit of legal wrangling regarding the name of the team. Lotus Cars said that Fernandez didn't have the rights to use the name because David Hunt, the brother of James and the owner of the Lotus name since 1994, wasn't in the position to sell the rights. Proton, which owned the Lotus car company at the time, said they owned the name in the automotive world and in Formula 1, and said that Fernandez wasn't allowed to use it. Fernandez had acquired a license to use the name for the 2010 season, but this was terminated at the end of 2010 because Fernandez was allegedly breaching the license. Repeatedly. Later that year, Clive Chapman, the son of Colin Chapman, said that he agreed with the Lotus group and said that the Team Lotus name should not be used in Formula 1 presumably to protect the legacy of the previous incarnation of Lotus that went under in 1994. Since Lotus had also teamed up with Renault, it meant that there was this unique situation with two teams having similar names on the grid. So, Fernandez acquired Caterham Cars and renamed the team Caterham for 2012 instead. Virgin, meanwhile, would become Marussia as it teamed up with the Russian car maker. At the season opening round in Australia, Narain Carthacane and Pedro de la Rosa didn't qualify for the race, which is the last time a car has not been able to get within the 107% cutoff point for starting a Grand Prix. Others since have been allowed to race due to extenuating circumstances, so this was really the final nail in the coffin for that team. The money was drying up, and they would only crack the top 15 once all season, when de la Rosa, who must have been old enough to collect his pension by this point, got 15th in Monaco. Once again, the battle was between Caterham and Marussia. Caterham's dreams of mid-pack were slow to realise and they still ended up near the tail end of the pack. But at the British Grand Prix, Kovalainen shocked everybody by getting into the second qualifying session at the expense of Michael Schumacher, and at Monaco he achieved the season's best result of 13th. Meanwhile, Charles Peake went fastest in practice two at Spa, but only 10 cars set a time, and then at Singapore got 12th place to ensure that Marussia, at least at that time, was 10th in the constructors. But at the final round in Brazil, Vitaly Petrov, who had denied Alonso the championship two years before at Abu Dhabi, denied Marussia finishing 10th by getting 11th place, so Caterham won the battle based off the best finish, and it meant that Caterham were going to take the money at the end of the season. Off track though, Marussia did have their troubles. In 2012, Marussia test driver Maria Di Valotta would be involved in an accident testing aerodynamics at Duxford Airfield. She crashed into the lift gate of the team's transporter and had to be taken to hospital, where it was then reported she'd lost her right eye as a result of the accident. In 2013, she died as a result of her injuries. And as explained, Marussia finished behind Caterham in the Constructors after a hard-fought and difficult season. And this was the thing, Caterham and Lotus always seemed to do better. In 2010, Virgin had actually finished bottom of the pile behind HRT and Lotus. The following year, Lotus beat Virgin again, and in 2012, beat Marussia, while HRT quietly disappeared. But in 2013, Marussia finally beat Caterham. The team up with Ferrari, even though they were still using the Cosworth engines, allowed Marussia to get hold of up-and-coming talent Jules Bianchi for that 2013 season, and both cars would be ahead of the Caterhams for the first round of the season in qualifying, and then at the Malaysian Grand Prix, Marussia rubbed salt into the Malaysian owner's wounds by having Bianchi finish 11th. Fernandez was a bit miffed about finishing last, and he said to the drivers and the staff that if the performances didn't pick up through 2014, he'd pull out completely, or at least sell the team. Kamui Kobayashi and Marcus Ericsson were on board for 2014 with brand new Renault hybrid power units. Marussia, meanwhile, managed to score a point. Marussia acted like they just won the championship with Bianchi scoring those points at the Monaco Grand Prix, and then in the July of 2014, Fernandez sold the team to a consortium of Swiss and Middle Eastern businessmen, with André Lotterer taking Kobayashi's place for the Belgian Grand Prix. But time was running out. The costs had escalated, and then a year after the death of their test driver Di Valotta, Bianchi had his fatal accident in a Marussia at Suzuka, in the typhoon conditions, a race I've covered recently. 
On the 21st of October 2014, just before the US Grand Prix, the catering team entered administration, and the FIA, who would normally have imposed penalties on teams that miss races, decided not to take action due to the situation that catering was in. Marussia wasn't able to make the Grand Prix either, leaving a grid of 18 cars. Given that Marussia was struggling financially and also dealing with the Bianchi crash, the FIA was incredibly understanding. Caterham was unable to get itself out of the hole that it was in. It did get one last hurrah at the 2014 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix thanks in part to some crowdfunding, but that was it. The second of the three teams had now gone. Marussia, having the payouts for the Constructors' Championship, was able to fund itself into 2015 and get itself out of administration. The new look, new name team was called Mana Marussia, and John Booth along with Graham Loudon was running the team, this being after some investment from billionaire Stephen Fitzpatrick. Will Stevens was in the car along with Roberto Meri with Alex Rossi dropping in for five rounds, but it wasn't all smooth sailing. They had to miss the Australian Grand Prix due to not being ready, and Stevens didn't start at Malaysia either. After that, it was a case of being reliable but well off the pace. The best result of the season came at Silverstone when Mary was 12th and Stevens 13th, and the team would finish last with zero points. And the only reason Stevens wasn't rooted to the bottom of the standings in the driver's standings is because Magnussen, who was drafted in to replace Alonso for Melbourne after that bizarre testing accident, didn't start the race and didn't have a chance to record a better result than Stevens could. 2016, Manor had one last chance. Rio Harianto came on board bringing a raft of sponsorship and Pascal Wehrlein, who was a Mercedes prospect, was in the other car, and Manor had picked up Mercedes engines for this season. The MRT-05 had a season-long battle with Sauber, and with Haas joining the grid it meant that whoever was 10th would get the prize money payouts, and it might mean survival or death for either of the two teams. Sauber was really under financial pressure too. Fairline would get 10th Austria, resulting in only the second time the Manor outfit would get a point outside of Bianchi's Monaco heroics. But right at the death, Felipe Nasa scored a 9th place at his home race in Brazil, so Sauber got the prize money and Manor got nothing. Investment talks were underway at the end of the season, but by the time January rolled around they had collapsed, and Manor once again had to enter administration. They had already paid their entry fee for the 2017 season, but the FIA gave it back to them, basically saying, look, you tried, but you're not going to make it, so we'll just give you the money back, we won't keep it, it won't be wasted. So Formula 1 returned to 10 teams and 20 cars. But to be honest, these three teams were doomed from the start, and it's amazing that two of them lasted as long as they did. Promises of cost caps didn't materialise, and if they had come along, they would have probably helped them, because inexperienced pay drivers just aren't going to do the difference on the track, are they? And they wouldn't have had to have spent so hard to try and keep up with those ahead either. Privateer teams entering in the middle of an economic crisis with costs due to skyrocket due to the hybrid engines were always going to put them under heavy financial strain. Haas managed to make it work, but as pointed out by the race, they were a customer team that switched to being heavily reliant on another team to maximise the amount of shared parts. While still not easy for Haas, it was still possible. And I guess this is why, if and when Andretti makes it, some of them want them to be adding something. With GM backing, it might make it a bit easier financially, and with cost caps, it might help them reduce the spend. But the three minnows that turn up in 2010 will always be the benchmark for any new teams that enter Formula 1, and people want Andretti to be mixing it in with the other teams, not just tootling around at the back, potentially going for many, many races without ever scoring a single point. And Caterham actually holds the record for most races without a point. Andretti probably can make it work, though, because they've got experience elsewhere, but... Formula 1 is a different kettle of fish. So then, a look at the three doomed privateers from the early 2010s. If this has reminded you of a time long gone or taught you something new, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on a future video. Massive thanks to the kind folk at Patreon and the channel members for the continued support, and if you want to help at a more personal level, there is a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord and to my socials. For members and super thanks, those buttons are underneath this video. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward, have a great day wherever you are. And goodbye.